All right. There we go. So what I tried previously was just broadcasting the entire screen instead of just the Blender tab. And I thought that that would you know, make it a lot easier for you guys to see what I was doing. But it turns out it just entirely wrecked the latency of the stream. So I'm just going to switch back to the regular Blender tab. Um, you guys are only going to see the main like layout screen of Blender, um, which, you know, is kind of inconvenient, but it's the only way that I could find that works. So, go ahead and introduce what we're doing again. We're going to be working on um, recreating the drill press animation that I made a while back, a few months or something. Um, and essentially, I'm going to give you like a full breakdown. And yeah. Let's make sure everything's running smoothly now. Looks good here, right? Yeah. Okay, so everything is working. All right, so I'll be honest, I can't remember a lot of how I made the actual drill bit. It's funny thing about this, it actually was somewhat, most of my animations are just me playing around in Blender, and then we get to a point where I find something that looks cool, and, you know, I just kind of run with it. So for the, for the screw, um, the actual drill bit, what I'll probably do is start by deleting the default cube. We don't need that. Um, I'm going to create a cylinder, and this is going to be our bit. This is what's going to be kind of drilling into the metal. I'm going to go into edit mode, and looks like screencast keys is working. I was having a little bit of a problem with that, but it looks like it's working now. So once we're in edit mode, uh, we're just going to stretch this out on the z-axis. Probably, I don't know, that much. That's a fairly long drill bit. We'll shrink it up a bit. Now to make this look more like a drill bit, I'm going to go ahead and toss an edge loop right here. Right in the center, and then kind of just drag it up about yay high or whatever. Um, Control, control B to bevel, and that's just going to give us a little bit of an edge so that when we go into face view, turn on transparency, and shrink all of this down, you can see it doesn't shrink the rest of it and it doesn't like deform the entire cylinder. So this part right here is going to be where it kind of attaches to the actual drill press machine, um, which I'm not going to be modeling because I could, but that would be just me experimenting. So I'm going to stick to what I know for right now. To create the, the tapered end, we're going to add another edge loop with control R, drag it down about somewhere around there. A lot of it is just estimation. Create an edge loop down here and use the scroll wheel to increase the number of them. And then we're going to turn on proportional editing, select the bottom face, and scale. And that's going to give us that, that tapered end that most drill bits have. And you know, it'll vary depending on the type of bit that you're using. But this is, you know, it's not about making the bit. It's about making uh, the booleans and all of that to cut through the metal. So I'm just going to do GZ, uh, move it on the Z axis, just bring it up a little bit, and we're going to start working on creating our actual metal. For that, I'm going to create a cube, edit mode, scale it up. That's, that's probably good. And then we're going to... Hit S to scale on the Y axis. 
and just turn it into a bar of metal. Now I want to select both of these sides right here. Hit I to inset, and we're going to create um, kind of like a square tubing piece of metal. And then in order to cut this through, I'm going to use a really handy trick. If you hit F3 and type in um, bridge edge loops, it'll come up. That's just going to basically create a link between those two faces, which if you have two faces on the opposite side of a material, it will create a hole with all of these faces filled in. So that's a super easy way to create that square tubing. Uh, I'm going to select the edges. And just for realism, I'm just going to bevel them just the slightest bit. Now comes the fun part. And to make this a lot easier, I'm going to create an edge loop right here. Scroll and just make a ton of faces. And that'll help with the boolean so it doesn't get as messy and whatnot. All right. Now let's go ahead and I'm just going to make a table for all of this to sit on. Hit S, scale on the Z axis. Hit S again to scale it up. If you do shift Z, it'll scale it on all axes but the Z axis. And that's that's decent. And then GZ just move it until it's touching the bottom face of the metal. Alright. So now we have our basic setup, right? We have our drill bit, we have our piece of metal, and we have our table. I'm just going to go ahead and name those just to keep everything organized. Right. Now comes the fun part. We're going to click on the bit and shift D to duplicate it. And the duplicated bit is going to be our Boolean, right? Basically what we want is we want this drill bit to go down into the metal. We want to see it cutting a hole. And then we want to see... Um, when the drill bit comes back up, we want the hole to still be there. So that's why we have to duplicate it. Once we duplicate it, right, we can see this moves individually. So this could stay as a Boolean object while this one comes back up. We'll reset the positions. And then, let's see, grab bit.001. Now I have, um, oh, what's it called? Bool tool um, add-on enabled which is incredibly helpful. So if I hit control negative on the numpad, it's weird. There we go. Oh, I have to select the metal. Control negative, and now you can see it formed a box around our drill bit. And what that's done is it's converted the our second drill bit into a Boolean. So you can see if I drag this down, you can kind of see, let me zoom in. It's making that, that hole. Right, so that's exactly what we're looking for. Go ahead and reset the positions. And then we want to, let's just say, I don't know. We'll, we'll create a keyframe right here. Same thing with this, create a keyframe. And then let's say maybe it takes it, I don't know, 50 frames and it's all the way through. And we'll create another keyframe. Now that's, you know, a bit fast. And it's also linear. I want to make it, um, what it's called, what's it called? Uh, I'll figure it out. We go over here to the graph editor. See right now it's linear, right? It stop. It starts moving, and it's a constant rate of speed. If we select these two points and go interpol, interpol. Oh my gosh, interpolation mode. Go Bezier. Now you can see it kind of smooths out that curve, and if we watch it, you can see it starts slow, 
eases in and eases out, which is exactly what we're looking for. And then we want to give it, I don't know, maybe just five frames where it sits there. I'm going to click on this, duplicate it, and move it out to frame 100. So it's an even, even curve, right? So it goes down, comes back up, right? Now we want to do the same thing. I'm, I'm curious if I can just copy these. And we want to apply it to our second bit. No. Z axis. Start frame zero. I messed up. I assigned it to the first frame, so it was basically creating a linear. So now you see they kind of match each other. Now we if we wanted them to match each other. We should have just parented them using control p but we don't want them to match each other what we want is for this to stay down that second bit to stay down and now if we watch it you can see we've created kind of that that drilling look right so that's how to create the boolean right and uh you know i might come in here and just, it's quite possible that there's going to be a wacky frame. You can see right now, if we look at the model of this, there's no hole in the actual geometry, right? This is happening live, and so it's constantly adjusting the adjusting the faces, and it'll create it'll create like lines going to the edges. That's why I created all of these edge loops. By increasing the amount of edge loops we have, it basically says, okay, the line I'm cutting doesn't have to go all the way to the corner it has to go just to the next line that we've created if you watch um, the original animation that i made you'll see one frame i think it's probably somewhere around frame uh, 130 i believe and it went <laughs> uh, it went catastrophically wrong and that exact thing happened and as it was updating that boolean it said hold up this face isn't right and it totally warped the entire thing. But it was kind of at the point where, you know, I didn't want to search and cut out that single frame. So I just left it. And honestly, I kind of I kind of regret that. But um I think probably by creating these faces, that's gonna fix that. So let's move on to um the next part. And that is going to be the sparks, right? All good drill press needs sparks. It's got to have something to show. Oh, wait, actually. I did forget one thing. I do like to offset this a bit. Just kind of move it down a little bit. And that way we can see, like, you know, as the bit goes in, the hole it's creating kind of precedes it so you can actually see it as it's drilling. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah, just like that. So in order to create the sparks, let me go into touch view real quick. And I'm actually going to set this up as a scene before we do that, because the sparks, it's going to be important that we have textures on everything so we can see how the glow interacts with them. So for our metal, I'm gonna just make it super simple for this. If you guys know any good ways to make metal, you guys can use that. Normally I use a bunch of image textures, but for right now, I'm just going to create a super simple metal texture by increasing the metallic to one. Um, increasing the specular to about uh, 0.8 or something and the roughness down to 0.3 or so and you can kind of see it gives us a shiny metal look now for the drill bit i'm going to copy that material hit the two here to make it its own separate thing and just kind of make it a brass look a little more yellow 
Yeah, like that. Uh, I'm going to click on the bit, right click and shade smooth. Come down to this little triangle here, go to normals, auto smooth, and that's going to make everything look real nice. Now, in the animation that I actually posted, I had a whole, like, you know, there were actually grooves on the bit. But, like I said, that was a mistake originally. I wasn't trying to make a drill press <laughs> animation. But once I saw that, I was like, hey, you know what? That looks like a drill bit. I'm going to make that into a drill press. So I'm not going to do the, the ridges right now because I can't remember how I did that. All right. Just put a basic brown-ish wood material. Yeah, that's that's wood colored. I used image textures in the actual animation. And if there's time afterwards, I'll replace all of this with image textures. But for right now, I just want to keep it keep it simple. And switch to cycles. I always prefer working in cycles. And you can see everything is very, very glossy. So let's go ahead and create our sphere that we're going to use as the particle emitter for our sparks. GC, scale it down. We don't need it to be that big. And you don't want it to be touching the metal if possible. But yeah, oh, that'll, that'll be good. So now we want to, well, I'm going to hide the bit real quick. We want this right here. We're going to go to the particle settings, new system. And you can see if we start it right now, we got all these particles falling downwards. We, we want them to hit this piece of metal. So in order to do that, I'm going to come over here to the physics panel, hit collision, and it'll already be calculating the collision for particles. You can see now, these kind of, the particles kind of bounce on the metal. The main problem is, you know, obviously when the hole you know, opens up, they explode out because they don't know what's happening to the faces. Uh, but we want them to kind of explode out anyway, so let's go ahead and do that with physics. We go back to the, the particles tab, and we go to velocity. Then we're going to change the object aligned velocity on the Z, maybe something like 1. What does that look like? 6. Yeah, like that. We want to be flying out. Um, normal velocity. Just crazy. Right? There we go. That's looking pretty good. And the randomize just also make it crazy. Let's see here. We might turn that down just a bit. That's a bit crazy. You see a couple of them are bouncing around in here. Now in order to make these look more like sparks, right, because right now there's just a bunch of white orbs. We want to make them look like sparks. To do this, I'm going to add a icosphere. We don't need it to be that defined, so click up down here. Subdivisions, just make it one. Move it up, GZ. Kind of looks like a D&D D &D dice. No, it's got a couple more faces than that. Anyway, uh, GX, just move it out of the way. We don't need it in the scene. Go to the Materials tab and make it glow using emission. Change this to like five or something. And now if we go back to our, our particle uh, settings, if we go close velocity, if we go to render, render as object, and go ahead and select our icosphere. Now you can see when these fly out, it's a bunch of white glowing orbs, right? So now if we make this instead of white, if we turn it orange per se, 
there's one color of sparks, right? What I like to do is shift D, duplicate it on the X, make its own texture, and just kind of make one that's, you know, a little more red. Shift D again, own texture, and one that is yellow. That we would just kept have you know a couple different tones. Um, they're not all the same uniform spark. Click on the emitter again. Render as object if you're only going to be sourcing one object, but since we're going to be sourcing three, we're going to want render as collection. If we want to select all three of these, hit M, new collection, and name it sparks. Hit OK. Now you can see over here. It's added all three icospheres to a new Sparks collection. If we head over to our uh, render or not, our emitter collection, instance collection, Sparks, and now you can see it's sourcing all three colored particles. <laughs> Hello, Seth. I do like the username. Excellent username. Uh, I always love a good SAO joke. Um, yeah, so here's our sparks, right? But you're probably thinking, you know, in the animation, they were long streaks, and that's how sparks look. So in order to do that, we're going to want to, it's actually incredibly simple. I'm going to set up the camera real quick so we can see it. Just kind of position so we can see the sparks. Like that, that. And then if we go to our render settings, should be in here. Oh, we know. See how to do it is in camera. We want to turn on motion blur. And I'm trying to remember where you do that. I haven't used motion blur in forever. Oh, right here. If you select motion blur, then the faster something moves, the longer the streak is going to be. Right? So if we hit render, got to change the frames it's trying to I don't know why blender did this but the max samples is, is 4096 we only need like 64 4096 is going to take ages upon ages to render all right so it looks like it's not actually bringing up the render screen so real quick I'm going to turn on screen and there you go now you can see, um, you know, they kind of starting to look like sparks. Now, of course, we can make them go a little bit faster using that velocity. Uh, let's turn that down, turn this up, rebake, and render. And now you can see we got a couple of a couple of sparks that are moving a bit faster. And you got the nice glow on the surface of the metal. Pretty much that's it for sparks. It was a lot simpler than I thought the first time I was messing around trying to make sparks. And now I put them in like almost all my projects. Anyway, so that's a super simple setup. Um, if you want, you can make them turn on, uh, go to the compositor, use nodes. It's going to have our image in here. And if we go uh, glare, plug that in here. We're going to, I have also have um, node wrangler on. So if I do control shift click, it'll add a viewer node. Now you can see if we, this is, if we hit B, it'll zoom out. And this is what it would look like with a bit of glare on it, right? It kind of gives you like that star pattern. Um, we don't want the star pattern. We're not trying to recreate, you know, dream effects or stigmatisms. So we want to change this to fog glow. And that's just kind of going to add, oops, I forget what the button is. There we go. 
just that bit of like glow, right? In Eevee, you would just turn on Bloom, uh, and we could totally render this in Eevee, but uh, I love cycles for simple stuff like this. Uh, go high, just kind of tweak the settings, you know, until it looks good. Well, it looks nice. Brush will be point eight. If you ever want to create one of these joint uh, things, just make sure that the both lines are coming from the same point. Hit shift, right click, and drag, and it'll create a point right there. And that allows me to just plug in one line, and it'll go to both the viewer and the compositor, which is incredibly handy. Sometimes, sometimes I just you know, duplicate these a bunch, just make them really glow. And actually, I'm going to see what EV looks like. Turn to ambient occlusion, bloom, screen space, motion blur. And then another cool trick, I learned this one uh, watching Ian Hubert's uh, Patreon tutorials, which I highly recommend getting if you're into that kind of sci fi um, vibe, but not really you know, like the super clean, like pristine sci-fi, more of like the dirty, grungy sci-fi. Uh, is one of my favorite artists ever. I learned this cool trick. If you add, go light pro, irradiance volume, and just scale it up until it covers your scene. This basically allows you to make Eevee look more like cycles. You can see right now our metal, right? It doesn't actually look that good. Whereas in cycles, you know, it looks much more like metal, right? We have all this, this glow happening and, you know, everything's reflecting, but we don't get that in Eevee. And that's where the irradiance volume comes in. If you come down here to indirect lighting, bake indirect lighting, wait a little bit. And in this case, didn't really do a whole lot. You kind of see it starting to give it a little bit more something. It's it's a real finicky process. You gotta you gotta mess with it a lot. Let me try increasing the number of points. Just kind of see. See if we can fix this. Mm. Nope. Sometimes it'll make a scene look completely different and solve a ton of lighting problems, but in this case, I'm just going to render it in cycles. It'll be easier. And I think that's pretty much it. Other than adding image textures, but uh, there's a whole bunch of tutorials on adding image textures and my computer files are kind of a mess right now. So I think I'll leave it here. If you guys wanna, if you wanna render it, just come over here. I like rendering it as FFmpeg encoding change Matroska to MPEG-4, and that's going to be your .mp4 extension. If you just go render animation, each frame it's looking like is taking about seven and a half seconds. And it's just going to do this for all 250 frames of the animation. And you can kind of see the sparks starting, kind of shooting out. But yeah, 
that's about that. A um, couple more things. Let me close out of the render. If you want the spark thing right here to be um, invisible, in cycles, it's a lot um, easier. There is a, a button down here. Um, oh, where is it? Render show emitter. If you uncheck show emitter in the render, you're not going to see the little sphere, which is nice. If you're in cycles and you want to keep show emitter on, you could also just create a material, turn the alpha to zero, and now it's going to be invisible. Alpha is basically your transparency. So by turning it to zero, we've made it completely transparent. And then these over here, I just like to say don't show in the render. And then just render out a frame that has sparks. You can see it didn't really, it doesn't show the sparks now because I changed that. I forget, there's a setting that I do um, adjust and it fixes that. Also, you can see here, this is the this is the problem I was talking about. If you have the faces and stuff, it's going to try and warp all of this. Uh, that was it's a big problem that I have, and I still have it a bunch. I've managed to fix it once by coming over to, where is it? The boolean, right here, and then changing it to fast, will sometimes work. We'll just check. See, there we go. It fixed it. Changing it to fast doesn't always work, but I don't know. I've found that it's a lot more reliable. And, you know, we can still see it's still making the hole, so it's still working. But, yeah. That's about all there is to that. If you render it out and your sparks decide they just want to go anywhere and everywhere um i did forget to mention this if you go to your emitter go to the particles tab click on cache and you know we have something that we like right now and if you know if in the viewport it looks good just hit current cache to bake and that's basically just going to say okay whatever whatever the system is telling the particles to do right now that's what we want in the final thing and it's just going to lock it in and convert it to ram which keeps it from changing its path mid render if you, if it doesn't look good then you can hit bake right here and you can see the bar is going to slide across it's going to render everything out um and now this, all of your particle movement is locked in. And yeah, that's about it. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, if they have any more questions, just let me know. Um, and I'll probably answer them in the comments. If I get a lot of different things, then I'll probably, you know, make a new tutorial uh, touching on some of the questions that people had. So thank you everybody for watching, and I'll go ahead and end the stream.